It's just one of them days when I want to be all alone. It's just one of them days when I got to be all alone. It's just one of them days. Don't Take It Personal, Just One of Them Days was my first single. And this was when my whole life changed. Because now you got this little country girl trying to learn what's required of her now that she's decided to become an artist and things are in motion. So we go and we shoot the video. I'm excited. It's amazing, I thought. And it was very costly which I learned very early that I was not being given anything. It was somewhat being loaned to me and I would pay it back as soon as I made money. The good thing about having my family with me was that they always make sure I understood that these aren't gifts, okay? This is to kind of set you up, put you in position, but you're paying for your video. You're going to be doing, these are all things that a lot of times young artists don't understand. So I understood this concept, but I didn't understand imaging and what that meant. I was at an age where I was trying different stuff. I grew up in a hair salon, so I like doing different things, dyeing my hair, doing whatever. So I leave right after we've shot the video and all the press photos, and we go to the hair salon. And I ask for streaks. Well, they didn't come out quite right. My hair starts turning colors, and me, being the type of girl I am, listen, I'm not my hair, cut it. And she did. And I remember saying after she cut it, oh, that's cute. Okay, now dye it. And I come home at 12 and a half years old with short blonde hair, with boxes and boxes filled with photos of a little girl with long hair, with a center part, at a video shot. I didn't know this was a problem, man. I didn't know that this was gonna be an issue. I didn't know that this was going to cost me money, okay? I didn't know that you were supposed to be consistent in those things. Who knows this at 12? I mean, well, maybe somebody does, but I didn't. And we had this whole big meeting, this conversation. My mom was devastated, not because of the music stuff. She could care less about that. She was just like, you cut all your hair. You can't do this type of stuff without me and my permission. Like at this point though, do you put a kid that's in the middle of recording their first album on punishment or what do you do? So yeah, I was on punishment, nothing but studio, home, school. And then we decide, well, let's shoot the video again. And we don't like that one. One of the first videos was actually shot on top of the checkers in my hood. We were on our national highway on top of the checkers. I'm singing the song. I'm thinking this is gonna be the greatest thing ever. Listen, first two videos get scrapped. And then Dallas says, Monica, let's at least give you your own thing. He said, you know what? Tion is rocking blonde short hair. He's like, you're definitely going to be a pop star. I'm looking at him rolling my neck like, nah, I doubt I'll ever be a pop star. You know what I'm saying? Where I'm from, I'm giving the whole roundaway girl speech. And he said, Monica, you don't understand that you are a great. Everything should be your own. And I said, well, I was just doing my own thing then. He said, well, I'll tell you what, we're gonna meet in the middle. Let's at least do black short and that be your thing. I'm not gonna, listen, you want your hair short, that's on you. I was like, well, I love black hair, I'm cool with that too. That's what I was born with. We go black, we fly to New York, we shoot the video, it's like zero below. So I'm tight-faced the whole time. But I'm doing my job, you know, I'm just, I've never experienced this stuff. Now I'm in a different state. I'm supposed to be walking, holding hands, smiling. It's like two degrees. I'm from Georgia. Our cold is not like New York cold, but, those became very legendary moments. And that video, which was the third video, became the video that the world saw. And I actually even shot the album all in the same week. We shot the album as well too. And if you look, the album cover is literally me with my leg propped up on a broken fence. And that is like one of the most iconic moments for me. And that was just me 
Being a little girl in a city I had never experienced before saying, you know what, I'm just gonna own it. This is where I am, I'm here for a reason, bring it. And that's the history of it. But three times to get just one of them days right. One of the things that being a kid in this type of industry lends you to is deciding, are you gonna focus on personal or professional goals? And me, I decided to focus on both. And one of those things was obtaining my high school diploma, but the goal I set was to be at the top of my class. It was really dope to actually graduate valedictorian on my class and be able to speak, but I also took it upon myself to sing. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I sang a gospel song at a graduation that was filled with people that didn't look like me but they respected me because I was one of the few people that were in school and actually working at the same time. People would say, you know, it's probably easier this way, but it's actually a lot harder because you have to be accountable at all times. I have to get the work done. Not only do I have to turn it into my teacher, but she would turn it into the state. And we checked in in all the states that I traveled to. So it was real. And my graduation just meant a whole lot to me. I remember us doing it at 103 West. To this day, what I wore, the shoes, which were wrong. I remember every bit of it because that was a pivotal moment for myself and my family. Hi, and welcome to 1515, smack dab in the middle of the summer album season with a score of big new records hitting the racks nationwide, or at least on their way. We've been taking a look at these new releases over the next half hour, starting with the latest from the other Belle of Atlanta, 17-year-old Monica. Already a chart topper with The Boy Is Mine, her duet with Brandy, this one-time church singer has more than a decade's worth of showbiz under her belt, and now she's hoping her brand new album will rocket her back to the top on her own steam. Hi, what's up? I'm Monica. Welcome to the South. People in the South, we are always taught to achieve, you know, not to conceive. Now, this room basically is where my mother has decided to keep all of my plaques. These are all the <laughs> clippings. Those, that's a billboard clipping that she put together. Self-assurance is what I speak a lot about on this album. Self-respect. Um, dominating your own area, you know, not being dominated. You know, basically, the simple way to say it is being a leader and not a follower. <laughs> to the sophomore album. I've been blessed with um, five number one singles. I was blessed with the platinum album the first time. But personally, I am here in Atlanta and I live a more peaceful life because I'm at peace with myself. We're on the way to, to the jewelry store. Whoa! And, um, what we, um, damn year was this for? Basically, phone? we're getting ready to go and just gonna go with me to get my hair done and they're gonna go with me to this restaurant that I go to all the time. But she just lost one. Fourth <laughs> Street Central Avenue in downtown. We gotta get off Fourth Street and Central we are gonna go by the jewelry store, which I do not do on a regular basis. I do not splurge. Whew. Lord, I'm scared myself. <laughs> Look, we have a jewelry thing. We have to like put ourselves on a budget before we come in here. It's ridiculous. <laughs> platinum records and platinum jewelry. All right. All right. Good concept, huh? That's it. I thought of it. Now we're headed to get my hair done, which is mandatory as hot as it is. Ladies, there's nothing wrong with the weave as long as it's done right. At 11 oh. years old, I wanted to do hair. My aspirations were to be a beautician. And once I figured out that I had a gift greater than that, I just pursued it. I look at this as my job, my livelihood, my being. Nothing that I ever do will change Monica. My favorite pastime is eating. What do you mean? With Monica, it's probably been that element about the South and the way she's been raised and everything else that keeps her so grounded. Ooh, caviar, ooh. And she's like, I sing, that's what I do, it's a gift from God, so what? Uh, like, you like me, like me, if not, I'm ready to get back to what I was doing. So that's a natural, that's a natural superstar. So not much has changed from then to now. Uh, not for me. I definitely live a peaceful life living in Atlanta. And there have been a lot of conversation over the years about where I'm actually from. I'm from the South Side. You know, I grew up Old National, 
that whole area. I went to North Clayton Middle School and High School for about six months uh, before my first album came out. But my parents, once they split, my father and his sisters and brother were all Zone 3, Cleveland Avenue, Brandywine, Hibiri Court. That was their area. So I'm a little bit of both worlds because, of course, I was spending time with both parents. And my mother and father, they all kind of grew up around each other. They were all from Noonan, Georgia. It's the area that I love even now. My kids love it there. I go back, I can do me. I move around the way I enjoy moving around, which is as normal as humanly possible at this point. But what's funny is I learned a lot being around my dad and his sisters and my big mama, my granddaddy. You know, there the rules were different. You know, my mom lived a very, I won't just say religious, it was all about respect. You know, even though we were at church two, three times a week, that was for sure. That was a foundation that was laid. One that I would definitely need as I went through different things. But when I was at my dad's, you know, you operated more like adults and you were given more room to make moves. And I came in contact with a lot of people, both good and bad, you know, and life was very full because I was able to see it from two totally different sides and two different perspectives, and I'm definitely a mixture of my mom and my dad. Please stand. Kindly remove your caps and to honor America, join in the singing of our national anthem, which will be presented tonight by Grammy Award-winning Arista recording artist and hometown girl, Monica. crazy because the planes are flying over and this is a heavy moment because it's the World Series you're where you from you know I'm in Atlanta and the Braves were uh, really doing an incredible job at that time and you know I'm a young girl I'm young I'm in a space where there are so many people around, and I had been performing for years by then, but I tell you, when you're a person that family is important to you, making them proud starts to become a big thing. You know, um, 
I felt that way in talent shows, but definitely now I'm 17, 18 years old and I'm doing things all over the world that my family are really watching, they're looking at. And so I remember being out there and it being freezing cold, but me almost not feeling anything the entire time I sang the national anthem because my family was with me. Giving them the kinds of experiences that we only dreamed of meant the most in the world to me. And I still feel that way to this day. When I do a lot of things, sharing it with them really is the first thing that I think about. So I remember my mom and papa and my aunt Laura, all of them being there and them watching, you know, the glass, all of them start to look the same. So you don't know which is which, but you know that they're watching you. And coming back, my mom's clapping, my aunt's clapping, we all hugging each other. And I remember Papa saying, they got the best hot dogs in the world up here. And uh, just having those moments stand out to you. But it's also a reminder that, again, anything is possible. You pave your own way. You know, I wouldn't have thought of being there, but no one could tell me I couldn't be there. No one could tell me that I didn't belong there. No one could tell me that because of where I was from that I couldn't be in a space like that. A lot of the people that were sitting there and watching me on the field that day had never heard of me. That was their first introduction to me. That was a special time for me. So I just look at events and moments from a very different perspective because I'm still trying to live out the purpose that I've always known that I've had. And that, that purpose-driven inner being that just kind of sits inside of me always pushes me to do my best no matter what. But that is a scary arena to be in. And when you see the planes flying over and the flags flying and everything's happening, it's a lot to take in. But I, I look back and I look back with pride because I made my family proud. I love the fact that people are able to document so much now. When you look at my Instagram, you would say, oh, Monica loves photos. But that love for photos and memories actually started with my mom. She actually has a room and her basement are dedicated to just all of our memories, my brother included. But when I look at my career sometimes, I think about some of the most amazing things that I've done aren't really on camera. And so I tell the new school, like, listen, you're in a generation where you can capture it all, capture it. You know, some things only happen once and everything that's meant to happen will. You don't know when it'll be, so be prepared. I look back at it and I, I noticed like when it became the big thing to go to the Met Gala. And I remember going to the Met Gala um, with Oscar De Laurenti or walking the runway with the late, great Carl Lagerfeld for Chanel and being about 18, 19 years old. And you know, I'm like, I don't really give myself a lot of credit all the time. And I definitely see myself as the underdog. I've always been that. And I don't say that in a derogatory way. I say it in a way that I always had to fight a little extra, do a little more to ever be considered. Um, I remember one time hosting the Lady of Soul or Soul Train Awards and was nominated like three or four times and in one category nominated three times, three of my songs against one other person and still went home with nothing. But I left smiling and, and everyone else was kind of like fussing and were in disarray. But I realized that for me, even being present and being nominated, that's a win. Where I'm from, it's not the norm. So my perspective on things made me the underdog that didn't mind that position. I'm not always fighting to get out of that position. I'm fighting for the people that's in that position too. It's funny because a lot of the greatest moments in my lives, they aren't online. So to this generation, they don't even <laughs> exist. And I'll get messages sometimes like, you know, one day I hope you actually, I'm thinking to myself, I did that a few times already. But by God's grace, whether you remember it or not, I was there. You might not have even been born when I was there. It's funny to me, but I know that I'm the underdog for a reason because everyone else that sits in that seat, they need to know that it's not a bad place. 
It's just a place where you fight more. Not fight other people, but fight to make sure that you are doing your best and you're pushing past everything. Every time somebody said, nah, she can't do that. I didn't do it once. I didn't do it twice. I did it like 15, 20 times. She came in and it was amazing. The soulfulness, the depth that this young girl of 13 had. She tells people that uh, her attitude comes from my example, just watching me. My mother is my greatest role model. She loves her children. And not only that, she loves herself. So as a female, I looked at that. And um, it really made me a lot stronger. The first album was titled Miss Thing because um, Monica's attitude as a young girl was, you know, like someone who acted way older than her age. We've had three number one uh, platinum singles with Monica, a platinum album. The song she did for Space Jam became platinum as well. And it all has led up to this new album, The Boy Is Mine. Undeniably, they'll hear a difference in the second album. I mean, for the simple fact that I'm a little bit older and there's a lot of things that I talked about this album that I shied away from the first time around. She's been set up now as, hey, she's a singer, and people have said she's a singer, and they're waiting now to hear an album that a singer would deliver. I did do a duet with Brandy called The Boy Is Mine. It was produced by Rodney Jerkins. And I had a hunch when we finished it, and all the vocals were there, I, I, I felt real strong. I never felt this way about a song. I, I kind of felt it was going to go number one. I didn't think it would go number one so fast. run across a singer who has this tone, whether it was Tina Turner, whether it was Aretha Franklin, or whether it was Whitney Houston, all of them had very distinct tones, and um, Monica has a very distinct tone. She can sing in the studio, she can sing live, she can do it all, that's, you know, that's a complete artist. Not since the first Whitney album, and that string of Whitney albums, where that fresh young talent came to put that indelible stamp on music, this is going to be an album that we're going to be celebrating uh, next year and for many years to come. You know, I, I gave Clive Davis a many a headaches. He remembers all of my music, let's be clear, but I think he remembers some of my growing pains just as well. There were times me falling in love, tattoos, diamonds in the teeth, all of that stuff, and he would just look at me and you go, Monica. Okay, so w what are we doing here? Because he knew that there was a part of me that always knew what I wanted. I knew what I wanted. That, that doesn't mean that what we want is always what's best for us. And I, I had to go through the learning curve because when they signed me, they signed me as a child and I became an adult with these very same people. So one thing that Dallas always did was he just fought for me to always be able to be me. He looked my mother in her eyes and he told her things that allowed her to say, this is the person that I feel most comfortable with you signing with. I trust him. And trust is not something that you have in the music industry. You don't feel it, it doesn't come about, you, you shouldn't have it. And he knew that my mother and I had agreed when I was about 13 years old, that if at any point this no longer made me happy, then I was to walk away. See, my mom was not signed up for stage mom lifestyle. This isn't what she cared about. She cared about me. She cared about how I felt. And having people that understood that I was still a child so I would go through things that wouldn't be necessarily the best for an artist, but they would be best for me as a person was key. And the one thing that I really respect my mother for is that she never blocked it. I don't ever remember her telling me, be quiet, sit down, don't sing, Gore. Not that song, Gore. I don't remember a time like that. And so it allowed me to kind of flourish on my own. Rowdy was Dallas's label, but it was a subsidiary of Arista, and Clive was the head of it. I did not fully understand who he was and the magnitude of success that he had had prior to me, but Linda made sure that I knew a whole lot just after a meeting that we took. And I remember Dallas saying that 
I want them to love you the way I love you. I want them to see who you are. So I'm not going to give you any notes or tell you what to do. I want you to go in the office and I want you to do your thing. And I was standing on a small stage and there was a long table. There were chairs, executives, all executives that now at this point have known me 25 years. And at that time, we were all new. So the introductions are a little bit different when you're walking in and you're 13 years old and you got these adult songs that you're about to sing and everyone's just sitting there waiting to be wild. Here we go, cure up, let's go. And that's when where I'm from kicks in. And, and it kicks in in the right way because I refuse to stand in one place and sing. It's not what I do, how can you touch people like that? And so I remember coming off of the stage and just working my way through the entire room and I remember passing Clive and I stopped in the area that he was sitting in and it was like two degrees in there because he loves the air condition. And that's not what a singer needs, but I had already decided like, listen, we going in to kill it and that's that. I'm sitting right here in New York City in the very conference room where you and Dallas Austin came up to showcase your talent for me and those of us at Arista. And you strutted up and down the runway here, and you sang to tape, and you blew everybody away, including me. And I started singing uh, Forever Always by the time I got all the way back around, which was also on the Miss Thing album. And I just started seeing everything go from this to... And then after a while, you know, it was a... And then it became a full bop. That was the moment where he and I connected. But there's been a lifelong of connections between Clive and I because in those moments, I think he recognized that, listen, this kid knows who she is and she's willing. Willing meaning to work. I've never shied away from work, hard work, long work, tedious work, stressful work, strenuous work, work that was a lot on my family, my voice, my body. That was never me. I was pulling 18, 19 hours in the studio at 13 and still getting my schoolwork done. I was still valedictorian of my class. I was still meeting all the obligations and requirements that were laid before me. That's where Clive and I connect because he does not quit. He does not stop. Right now, in his late 80s, he still does more work than most people my age on a daily basis. So his belief in me also pushed me. It like catapulted me into saying, go even harder, work even more, explain yourself even better. It, it was a learning curve for me to learn the interview. You know, I was young and rebellious, so I refused to do media training and things of that nature. These are things that people have no way of knowing. I am pre-Instagram. There was no TikTok, there was no YouTube, there was no, you couldn't even Google. So the only way for people to know who you were and what you stood for and what you believed was for you to tell them, for you to be in these places and to make sure that they understood that. And the key was to sing, sing. And then when I had the opportunity to speak, make sure you're saying something. If I didn't have something to say that had some type of meaning, I just didn't speak at all. I sang and left. And that was very rare because I understood that there was no way for people to know who Monica Denise Arnold was if I did not tell them who that was. I didn't want anybody to have any preconceived ideas about who I was. I wanted them to know. And Clive and I connected on those things. My ability to continue to push, and I've never lost that. I recorded my whole album, Pregnant, a few times. Uh, it just... I look at everything as something to motivate me versus to deter me or to make me feel like I can't. I remember them telling me, listen, women that have kids aren't as successful. And I meant still standing was gonna prove that to be a lie. Not just for me, but for every woman that had children. So it goes back to my purpose. It goes back to being driven. And that has kept Clive and I with a 21 year working relationship but a 25-year friendship and level of respect that's not gone away. Forever.